coming back. I first test to those successful events is if people return after lunch. So, so thank you for being here. Um, I'm very excited for our next author, uh, Neil Richards, the uh, co distinguished professor of law at Washington University School of Law. His scholarly and popular writings on privacy and civil liberties have appeared in the Harvard Law Review, the Yale Law Journal, the Guardian, Wired, Slate, and many more places. Uh, he will be introducing his book, Why Privacy Matters. Thank you, Mike. I, I should also say, it's not those Koch brothers. Um, <laughs> they, are, they are Kochs and they are brothers, <laughs> but they, it's a lovely family from St. Louis who are graduates of our, of our fine university who built Ferris Wheel to Jimmy Buffett uh, and don't fund things many people in California don't like. Okay, so, so my, my book is called Why Privacy Matters, and it's about why privacy matters. It's uh, um, uh, sort of truth. That it, in a sense, it is a, uh, a long-form version of a conversation that I kept having, and I realized I kept having it with people literally all over the country, in, in, a, in other countries. I had it with my uncle Keith, who lives in Chester in England. I had it with... Uh, the woman that cuts my hair, I, I had it with, with bartenders, I had it with, with people I was waiting to go through a metal detector at Bush Stadium in St. Louis uh, to watch a soccer game. Um, and, and Mark mentioned the conversation that we had, a three-hour conversation that we had in his car uh, after an event uh, in like 2003 or 2004. Um, I seem to have a lot of important conversations in my life in cars because <laughs> I had the conversation that reminded me that made me realize about the importance of the privacy conversation in a car in Silicon Valley when I called an Uber. Um, and what happened is I, I get in the car, and, 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 the, and the privacy conversation, and actually Danielle has been in a, been an in Uber with me where we, I've had the privacy conversation. Um, in the Uber, just say. In an Uber, yeah. Um, I, I get in the car, and they say, oh, where are you going? And weird question in an Uber, because you figure they know. But I said, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going, I was in, I was in Silicon Valley, I was going from my hotel in Palo Alto to Stanford Law School to talk about my first book. And I was asked by the, the driver what, what I did, and I said, I'm a professor of law. Um, they go, what kind of law? Because that's the thing people ask lawyers. Um, I don't know if they really care, but that, that's what we get. And I said, well, privacy law. And, and whenever I say this, as soon as the words cross my lips, one of two things happens. Some of the time, someone will go, oh, you must be very busy then. Ha, 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 we'll chuckle, and we're done. But the, the other times, the more interesting times, what happens is that they, there's a little noise. Um, and it's a bit like a cough, a bit like a laugh, and it's like a sigh of something something precious leaving their bodies that they didn't realize the importance of before it was gone, and they go, ah, well, there is no privacy anymore, is there? And then these poor people, this poor Uber driver, uh, is sub gets subjected, to, don't ask me this question on a plane, um, is, is, is subjected to a, a long tirade about privacy is not dying, privacy does matter, privacy is about power, um, privacy is up for grabs. So what am I talking about today? And, and, and I, I, I realized at that moment that this was a conversation that I thought was important and that I thought was valuable and that I thought, to my mind, hadn't adequately been written down, so I decided to write it down, and six years later, this, this is the book. Um, it's not irrational, let me say it up front, it's not irrational to believe that privacy is dead. Or, as the lovely and uh, mercifully short, suffering Uber driver, because it was a seven minute drive to the law school, um, all my information is out there, it's creepy, but at least I have nothing to hide I guess. <laughs> this is not a crazy idea, right? So we have CCTV cameras. This is in, in my home country of, of Britain. Um, CCTV cameras everywhere, drones everywhere. Drones invariably come with uh, high definition video cameras. Um, companies like Manchester City Football Club are deploying facial recognition technology as, a, as an alternative to tickets. Um, and it's not just companies that are these sports washing front office operations of a human <laughs> rights denying environment destroying <laughs> petrochemical states like Manchester City that are doing this. Even, even beloved cultural icons like Taylor Swift uh, are deploying facial recognition on, unwittingly on their fans um, to try and identify uh, a real problem that Danielle's book gets into of stalkers, but the sort of the normalization of, of FR tech. 
We all know about Edward Snowden's revelations, which are shockingly nine years old, nine and a half years old now. Um, most people have heard of Cambridge Analytica. They know it was bad. They do it involve data and Facebook and the election. Most people don't know any more than that. We can, we can talk about that in the Q&A if you like. Um, these things are popping up in people's homes. Um, Amazon would like to advertise, tries to advertise as, this is not my wife, this is an actual Amazon advertising <laughs> uh, product. Uh, they want to have these in every room in our house. And even those of us who don't, who resist Amazon's sort of smart home IoT creep, we all have smartphones and these all have the same technology in them, just bigger processors, right? Siri and, and Hey Google and, and that sort of thing. So, so back to my Uber ride. Um, it wasn't crazy for her to say this, to believe this, to understand this, to feel that sense of helplessness about privacy. But what I said is, while it is okay, understandable to think that privacy is dead, and there can be no debate that privacy is certainly under threat, that's obviously the you know, least shocking revelation of the day here today. <laughs> um, privacy is not dead, but crucially, critically, importantly, privacy is up for grabs. If you take one thing out of what I said, um, beyond the stuff of Manchester, I'm a Liverpool fan, so beyond the stuff of Manchester City, um, and Taylor Swift, I guess, it's this. Privacy is fundamentally about power. Right, Francis Bacon, hundreds of years ago. Information is power. Disputes we have over privacy are, are disputes about power, and the power that human information gives to those who hold it, to those who wield it, to those who can deploy it, over everybody else in society. The NSA knows this. That's why they seek records <coughs> of our communications. They, they want to forestall terrorism, but they want to control human behavior through the deployment of information. But notice, noticeably, the NSA understands that this is a double-edged sword. They resist scrutiny. They, they insist on their own privacy surrounding their operations that are multiple layers of, of technical, legal, and operational security. Facebook wants to control your behavior in the sense that it wants to keep you hooked, but it wants to use data to target lucrative ads to get you to buy crap that you don't want. Um, that's another in instance of information being power. Now, the fact that information confers power does not mean that it is always sinister, just as the exercise of power is not always sinister. We didn't have these when our kids were small, but I understand uh, there's not just baby monitors now, there are like high resolution surveillance cameras to stop babies from, from injuring themselves or climbing out of the crib. I mean, small children are, you know, pint-sized self-destruction machines. Um, <laughs> the problem doesn't, uh, doesn't end there. Th these are actually my children, and that's actually my wife. Um, we use Find My Friends uh, to find out where our teenage drivers are um, when they are driving, you know, 3,000 pound machines at 40 miles an hour around the streets of St. Louis. Also, if you come to St. Louis or DC, stay off the roads. Um, <laughs> there, there are innocuous uses of information. There are socially beneficial uses of information. But regardless, even if we're trying to deter terrorism, to sell ads, or, or stop our 16-year-old son um, from, from driving off on a lark with our car, um, privacy remains fundamentally about power. So what I want to do in the, in the next maybe 10 minutes, as quick as I can, is to talk about three things. What privacy is, what privacy isn't, and three privacy values. Um, I can talk about this for seven minutes. I can talk about this for seven hours. Um, I'll try and err closer to the first uh, uh, estimate than the second. So, so, so what is privacy? I want to offer a working definition that I do in the book, um, just so you know what I'm talking about, so you can decide whether you agree with me or not. Um, and so I think a, a sort of working, provisional, hopefully as neutral as possible definition of privacy is just the degree to which human information is neither known nor used. Re Mix that around a little bit, it shows that we're, we're focused on information. We're focused on information about people, not about our pets, um, or about our crops, even though these technologies can be used to monitor pets and crops and other things in the world. It also directs us towards the human values. Danielle said something very similar this morning. Um, the human values that should uh, guide our uh, our, our, our examination of these questions and our, and our policy. Uh, it covers not just the acquisition of information, but also the use, right? The, the, when information goes out there, 
um, we have a thing in this prime still called a use restriction, right? The, and actually, the most interesting question, as lawyers know, is not, I don't want to hear your confidence as my client. It's when you tell me your confidence is, how can I use it? Who can I tell? What is loyal? What is beneficial? Right? So, so it's important to think about information um, being not just collection rules, but also use rules, but also the fact that information and privacy are matters of degrees. Privacy is not a binary state of on or off, known only to me in my heart of hearts, or known to everybody around the world. Um, you know, like in my heart of hearts, what I dreamt about last night. Only, only I know that. Um, on the other hand, the fact that John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and Beatles, everybody knows. My parents used to go watch them in the Cavern Club when they were dating. True fact. Um, most people don't know that. But like that fact, most information about most people, most of the time, most of human history, exists in the middle, in the, the, in the continuum, in the fuzzy gray area between known to only one person and known to everybody. And I think our thinking about privacy and our policies and laws around privacy should meet the information where it is, rather than where it is easiest to regulate or easiest to code. Okay, so, so how do we protect privacy? If it's about power up for grabs, well, remember, privacy is about power. We keep remembering this. Second, I think these fights we have over privacy, and these fights go back decades, if not hundreds of years. The struggles we have in our society, in our societies about privacy, are fundamentally fights over the rules that should or should not constrain the power that human information confers. Am I known? Am I unknown? Am I free to be different? Uh, am I not? Am I a part of society? Am I not? Am I marginalized? Am I not? These are the, the context in which privacy disputes in practice play out. Third, we have a choice. Right? We have a choice to do nothing, to just let disruptive business models trafficking in our data to persist, or to regulate them in some way. But even doing nothing is a choice. And so a privacy rule of some sort, leave 230 in place or not, is inevitable. So we face a decision. There's no, there's no neutral position here. There's no opting out of, of, a, of a privacy decision and a human information policy in our society. And so how should we do that? Well, there was a question earlier today about whether privacy, I think it was your question actually, about w whether privacy was uh, an end in itself. A lot of people do think that privacy is an end in itself, but in order to have a, a broader conversation, I don't want to get hung up on whether privacy is intrinsically valuable. I think we should just talk, rather than talking in, in, in possibly confusing terms about, well, privacy demands this, or that's a violation of privacy, we should explain why. This is a problem that Europeans really struggle with because privacy is a fundamental right. So the conversation's over there. And I think that's a problem because it's important to articulate when privacy is valuable and the times that privacy is not valuable. It's used to hide corruption or abuse or fraud or other things we may want to discuss. So I think we should think about privacy in instrumental terms. In terms of promotion of human values, what does privacy get us in general? What does privacy get us in this context? What does privacy get us in that context? And in terms of human values, we can, we can think of several. Um, but I think the, the, the ability to freely develop our identities, the ability to exercise, this was also mentioned, this, all these were mentioned this morning, um, to, to participate in democratic activity and, and exercise political freedom as self-governing citizens of a free society, um, and the importance of privacy to consumer protection, um, whether we're talking about data breaches or we're talking about um, the acquisition of, of consumer profiles or the manipulation of consumers in commercial context using their data. So that's what privacy is. Um, I'm probably not going to talk, given the time, about those values any more than in passing. Um, I want to spend the next sort of five minutes um, talking about some, some persistent but seductive myths about, about privacy. And these are, first, that privacy is about hiding dark secrets. Second, that privacy should be thought of in terms of creepiness. And, and if you can avoid creepy practices, you've solved the problem. Third, that privacy should be thought of in terms of control. And fourth, that privacy is dying. So, so first of all, privacy is not about hiding dark secrets. And it is not the case um, that those with nothing to hide have nothing to fear, even putting aside the fact that this was first coined by a literal Nazi, um, <laughs> Joseph Goebbels, um, we take ideas seriously here, and we, we examine their, their, their merit regardless of their dubious provenance, to say the least. Privacy is not about hiding dark secrets because 
Privacy is about po power, and nothing to hide is thus wrong on its own terms. All of us, all of us, as Danielle explained eloquently this morning, have something to hide. We have naked bodies. I noticed that you all wore clothes. I guess it's Berkeley that had the naked guy, right? Not, not yes. UCLA. Um, Very different place. That's the we all, yeah, we all uh, those guys, right? Um, we all importantly have the need to confide ideas, information, or feelings in our close confidants. And the trust in those relationships is essential to living a sane, successful, flourishing human life. Think about a doctor, right? You go uh, to meet a doctor, you've ne maybe never met them before. You sit there wearing a backless gown and maybe socks, we can get drafty. <laughs> and a person you've never met before walks in and examines your naked body and you tell them your fears and your ailments and they, because there's, a, there's privacy and confidentiality and trust, they help you. They can, then they need the information to better help you and everybody is better off. Second, nothing to hide misunderstands why privacy matters. Remember, privacy is fundamentally about power. I'm only going to say this about three or four more times. Um, also, nothing to hide focuses on privacy as an individual matter, when privacy is actually a social value. Right? The, the importance of masking, I think, showed my right to not wear a mask. I live in Missouri, where people talk that way. I mean, people that way in California, too. It's just, there's just a higher proportion of them in Missouri. Um, the benefits of, of uh, COVID restriction come from everybody, particularly when it's particularly dangerous, everybody wearing a mask, right? That, uh, I benefit from your wearing a mask, you benefit from my wearing a mask, I benefit from your having privacy, I, I benefit living in a society um, in which other people are free to develop their identities or keep their secrets or live their life in their, in their own way. The fact that masks also have a sort of privacy uh, effect is that it's just a really nice coincidence. Edward Snowden put it really well, actually, when he said, arguing you don't care about privacy because you've got nothing to hide is no different from saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. Okay, so privacy is, sorry, uh, privacy is also not about creepiness. Um, I know, right? It, 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 yeah, she, she is in the uncanny valley. Um, we hear this a lot, I'm sure everybody has said in this room, oh, that's a really creepy information threat, or what they're doing with my data is really creepy. Th that's a natural feeling, a violation of a, of a social norm or an expectation, but as a test for privacy, creepiness is deeply problematic for a series of reasons. First, it's over-inclusive. Many things that uh, originally seem creepy, like railway cars, which <laughs> trundle down the tracks at the speed of 30 miles an hour, uh, and people fainted at first, um, seem creepy. Some of them turn out to be good. Even Facebook's new, those are also my children a long time ago. Actually, there's one. It's creepy. There's Woody. Oh, yeah. Uh, you get me. Young, young Woody. Um, Facebook's news feed feature um, actually w w was, was condemned, but actually turned out to be fairly useful in its functionality. Other things Facebook did with your information, really problematic, but we didn't maybe think of them as creepy because we were creeped out by by the newsfeed. Creepiness is also under-inclusive, right? Things like social scoring that we don't know about, information practices that can harm us that we never learn about, never prompt the creepy reaction, and thus, uh, if creepiness is our test, are not privacy problems. Creepiness is also, third, malleable. Creepiness rests upon the violation of a social norm or social expectancy, and social norms change, and social norms can be shaped by powerful actors like companies with a design of platforms. We used to think it was unnerving to get searched with our hands in the position of surrender every time we boarded a plane. That has become normalized, that search of our bodies. Even the millimeter wave machines, which have thankfully were retired, that took pictures of our bodies underneath our clothes, that's why it happened in the, in the room in the back, they didn't let you see, um, became, became normalized. Uh, and, and in a rare moment of candor, the then Google CEO, Eric <laughs> Schmidt, said, our policy is to get right over that creepy line and not cross it. And I think that perhaps is self-explanatory. Okay, so, so one solution to this problem is, well, we're just going to put consumers in control of their data. And that's pretty good. And I'm, 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 uh, I'm grateful to, to, to Woody, the next two slides I have stolen shamelessly um, from, from one of his presentations with, with his consent. That, that, that's an okay form of control. 
Control is offered particularly by tech companies, but also by regulators traditionally as a solution to privacy problems. If we all vary on our preferences, well, we'll just get people the choice to do what they want, and then everything will be fine. Just a few problems with it. First of all, it's overwhelming. Um, this is Woody's slide um, and, and Woody's argument. Um, privacy is often presented as a binary choice. Yes, privacy or no privacy. In, in reality, we have things like privacy dashboard. This is one of many on the iPad. Um, but, and then, of course, also Woody's slide, um, we have multiple pl uh, platforms, multiple accounts. We can't remember all of our passwords. How can we remember all of our privacy settings, particularly when they're constantly changing? Second, perhaps even worse, controls an illusion. Um, we are, like with the add choice buttons, we're never given the choice of stop sur surveilling me to serve me surveillance-based ads. Um, you just get to ask whether you like this ad or not, uh, or whether you found it more relevant or not. The real choices promised by control of privacy are never offered when they're inconsistent with, with business models. And finally, control completes the creepy trap. We're creeped out, but we're given these privacy dashboards and privacy policies, and if we read the fine print and we manipulate the dashboards and push the right buttons in the right order uh, and spend enough time to do that, we can control our privacy um, every single time we access a website. So this is what happened to me. I was wanting to read an article about the Schrems case. Um, I get a, a cookie blocker. I really wanted to just read the article about, about Zuckerberg. Um, but I decided, oh, why not? Uh, I'm not going to agree and close. I'm just going to learn more. So I opened it up. Uh, do I have permission to? This is one privacy pop-up on one website of an Irish newspaper among a hundred websites that I visit in a year, or maybe more. Um, store access information as a device, advertising and content measurement, audience insights and project development, personalized content, personalized ads, social media, actively scanned device for identification, um, extended measurement, I, that sounds bad. <laughs> and, and you could actually do it for all of the 1,000 advertising partners um, on that particular website. So, well, we should, we just give up. We just, we just hit the reasonable <laughs> button, and we go on and we read the article, and we trust that everything is going to be okay. But critically, the illusion of control completes the creepy trap, right? We feel, well, you know, my information's out there. I had a chance to monitor my privacy. They gave me the opportunity, and I chose not to because I wanted to read the article. And, and notice not just has harm and risk of loss been outsourced or externalized to us, the guilt of protecting our privacy, right? We have this feeling that we had a chance to do it and we didn't take the chance because it was a loaded, rigged game against us. But still that nagging psychological doubt remains with us and we become more accepting of, of, of the, the, the creepy practices that we're not entirely aware of. So control actually is used to subordinate consumers. And finally, control is inefficient. Um, if your sister uploads, your twin sister, but if your sister uploads half of your genome to 23andMe, all the control in the world is not going to let you stop her from, from doing that, even if it is used to convict people of crimes based upon data that other people may have uploaded that is relevant to them through familial relationships. Let me, let me stop here because I want to get the, the panel in and be mindful of my time. Um, the, the, the final point is, is, is that privacy is not dying. Um, we, this is a, a more subtle form of the, of, the, uh, of, of the privacy is dead argument, but it basically takes three claims. The fact that lots of information is being collected, people don't care about privacy, and then concludes it's just it's okay not to care about privacy because sharing is awesome. Um, they do that. Can you elaborate a little? That's the innovation kind of. That is. The, well, awesome. We can talk about that more later. But okay. it is undeniably true <laughs> that lots of information is being collected. It is undeniably false, backed up by a ton of surveys and actual behavior, that people don't care about privacy. And of course, privacy is about power. It's also an irrelevant question to say, Zuckerberg, that sharing is awesome. <laughs> Um, that's not the point because privacy is about power. Privacy is not dying, but privacy is up for grabs because privacy is fundamentally about power. Maybe in the Q&A we can get into um, the, the important privacy values of identity, freedom, and protection. Um, 
that I think our privacy rules should promote. Because in an information society, when everything we do as, as individuals, as family members, as citizens, as voters, as consumers, is mediated by vast swaths of deeply revealing information about us, information privacy is the whole ballgame. And that's why privacy matters. Thank you. Thanks. We'll welcome our panel up now. Uh, Alan Butler is the Executive Director and President of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Uh, Danielle Citron, you have already met from the University of Virginia. Mark McKenna from ITLP, you've already met. And the moderator is Nikita Agarwal, postdoctoral fellow here at the Institute of Technology Law and Policy. Neil for that excellent uh, presentation. Um, why don't we turn it over to the discussants uh, to offer some uh, remarks? And Danielle, uh, do you want to kick us off? We're not gonna. Haven't we heard from you like enough today? No. Right? No. <laughs> Never enough, Danielle. <laughs> All right. So, so maybe um, I'm gonna, in my remarks, really just elaborate on uh, Neil's insight that we have nothing to hide. Right. The the notion that you know, privacy is irrelevant, as Neil explains, because, and so often we hear that as if um, somehow we have something to be ashamed about, that, that really if you are seeking privacy, and this is a Posner insight, Judge Posner's article from Georgia Law Review, basically, that, that privacy is just about hiding things that we don't want other people to know about us, because then maybe they won't hire us because we have some dark secrets would justify not hiring us, right? That is, there is a long, um, the, the notion of uh, you have nothing to hide has a pedigree. It has an intellectual heft to it, right? Um, and I want to I wanna illustrate Neil's point with a little bit of Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, Being in Nothingness, in which he talks about two different kinds of experiences of shame, right? And, and he uses the example, uh, for one example, of the peeping tom. That he he asks the reader to imagine the peeping tom who's crouching uh, by a keyhole and staring into the keyhole, looking at, as Sartre describes, a woman um, in her room. And Sartre also describes the peeping tom is 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 her aggrieved lover, and uh, the. The peeping Tom hears a rustle at the stairs. And the peeping Tom is immediately awash, like face turns red, and awash with feelings of shame. And Sartre explains that feeling that the peeping Tom has is, is a feeling of being caught, right? Of being caught doing something that society thinks is normatively unappealing, right? And that is not a, really a feeling of shame, but of being ashamed, right? Of something that you've done. In some respects, we would say, it's not really that the NSA has privacy rights, it's that the NSA doesn't want to be caught doing things it would be ashamed about. I mean, I'm just ripping off of your slide, Neil. Um, right, and our peeping Tom is really, the question is not shame, but rather being ashamed. And then Sartre exclaims, by contrast, there is this concept of pure shame. That pure shame is what happens when um, we are uh, unclothed without our permission. That is, when someone takes our clothing off of us, and we don't want them to do that. And so people see us naked. Um, we are then, Sartre explains, seen as someone right, seen as an object, right? That is, we are someone who lacks clothing, right? We are not subjects, but instead, so I alluded to this a little bit earlier, right? But rather that we're objects, right? And that the, pe the feeling of pure shame is one of a feeling of being vulnerable, right? Of being reduced to your body in ways that make you subject to attack, right? That make you subject to being seen differently as someone who isn't clothed, right, as being seen as an object. 
So the kind of sort of concept of we have nothing to hide is is really like a, it's always been a smoke screen, but I think as you um, explored so well in your book, so this is my, what do they say, two fingers to yes, Neil, of, of that one of the many chapters. I love the book. So the chapter uh, that had to do with you know dis debunking the fallacies um, appealed so much to me for the reason that, that made me think of that distinction between being ashamed and a pure shame, right? And that, that being ashamed has nothing to do with privacy. And pure shame, of course, does, right? Is everything to do with it. So um, thank you for the spectacular book. We all know I loved it. Um, and I have to say, am I? Okay, I'm going to be quiet. I want to say something, but I'm going to. I don't know if I have your explicit affirmative consent to. Um, uh, I'm going to say it because it's joyous. <laughs> okay, and Neil so also put it on Facebook, so I'm assuming this is okay. His 50th birthday was the other day, and we did not get to celebrate together, which as a privacy family we would normally sort of enjoy doing. So total non sequitur. Happy birthday, Neil. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm feeling embarrassment, but not shame. And we have a oh, no. Do you forgive me? Of yeah. course. Okay. Also, P.S. We have a reception at the end of the day, so what do you know? Yeah. We can celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's gonna buy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy it. Daniel, will buy it. Daniel will buy it. So, uh, are we just going to let? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I also love the book too, and you know, as I said at the beginning of the day, um, you know, so much of this book is, you know, our ideas that I've seen Neil developing over the course of his entire career. So it's really, I think, it was a, a joy to read it. Um, in part because it was sort of seeing all these different threads of Neil's work come together, right, in a way. Um, and I think, you know, the one of the sort of, I think, highest, uh, thing, the highest form of highest praise you can give to a book is that, like, it felt like so simple to read it because it's beautifully written and it also just, it just kind of unfolds as a story where there were, like, very few times when I was like, uh, I don't know, I need to know more about that, like, you know. Um, which also made it hard to come up with, to figure out what to say at the end, because I was It's very like, unlike you to not. I am, uh, so, <laughs> but I, f I found a couple, so. <laughs> so um, yeah, well, so I, I'm just gonna make like two quick observations and then uh, maybe try to provoke a, a little bit of a fight between you and Danielle, which is, uh, uh, so, you know, just in sort of like tying together what I was saying in the, in the last panel, this sort of idea, you know, the, the continued reference to privacy as a social value and not just an individual value, I think, is a really important move that's been happening in privacy scholarship because I think it is a way of like decentering the sort of model that you need to find a sort of unique uh, harm, and I think that's a that's a really important um, important development. Uh, one thing that really struck me about the book is, and this is sort of in part what I was also saying earlier, um, so much of I'm going to call early privacy, um, by which I mean the privacy scholarship you all were doing early in your careers and sort of people who were writing in that same time period was so defensive about like, we gotta figure out what privacy is, right? We gotta defend it. And one thing I found really refreshing about this book was the sort of, uh, the comfort level and the sort of confidence with which you were just like, it's actually not that important that we like get a really specific concrete thing. And, and one reason I say that is like, there's actually hardly any concepts in law that we have that level of concrete sort of specificity about, right? And it's usually, fine, right? We need a working definition. Like, I mean, I got a bunch of torts students in here, and we're like, that's the whole class in torts. It's like, we got reasonableness, and we got foreseeability, and they're like, what the hell does that mean? And I'm like, well, let's talk about it for three weeks, and then we'll have a little, have a little more purchase on it, right? And so, you know, you've, like most of the most, the, the most significant concepts in law, um, you know, you have a relatively high level of generality understanding, and that we, what you build over time is examples, right? And you build lots of sort of specific things, and there's no reason why privacy can't be that. Um, but having that alongside a whole series of sort of privacy isn't this, right? I think, uh, for me, has been really helpful in just sort of, you know, somebody with only one kind of foot in this, uh, in this tent. So, uh, so here's the one I want to provoke just a little bit, which is um, I totally understand the motivation uh, to say privacy is an instrumental value, right? And to think we really need to talk kind of about, like, what is it? What is it for, right? Like, what is it aimed for? I do wonder, though, a little bit, like, you know, because you say this is all, in the end, kind of a balance, right? This is about degree. It's not about a binary choice. So it's, that means it's balance, and that means, you know, even in some of the examples you gave, 
a lot of how this shakes out on the ground is basically competing values and trying to figure out which ones we're going to weigh more and does national security outweigh the privacy interests, right? Are there is the interest in solving crime, uh, you know, are the are the are the commercial interests like it's all just sort of cost benefit in that way. I wonder if you see a little too much ground in the balancing by conceiving of privacy as a, as an instrumental value, right? And so in that respect, I sort of I was struck a little bit listening to Danielle talk about privacy's centrality to so many human values. And, and maybe this is not like a fundamental difference, but just a, as a rhetorical one, I guess I'm, I'm curious about how you react to hearing privacy is an instrumental value as opposed to being sort of constitutive of all the other um, sort of major values. So I'll just, I'll just stop there. Um, well, thanks uh, first for all for having me here. I'm happy to be part of this conversation and to talk about uh, and be witness to the discussions of so many great books. I mean, this book has so much in it that uh, it's like where to start, but uh, so much good in it. Um, and one thing I really wanted to come at this from is a perspective of someone who works both, you know, thinks about the law as it's sort of structured and conceptualized, but also works very much like in the policy space of trying to figure out like what it should be, what it, how it can work, um, really to the building off of that somewhat to like the instrumentalist view of it. Um, and thinking about that, the process of making law in part because really that's, we're at a moment right now. And I think uh, for, for it, I'm just particularly like aware because of, of Epic's work of the fact that there are so many processes going on right now where lawmaking, rulemaking bodies are really thinking about this issue and how to build structures that do embed, I hope, <laughs> embed human values. There's, there's certainly people out there that are advocating, not necessarily advocating for that. Um, but we have you know, legislative uh, active processes at the state and federal level. We have regulations going on at the federal level, the Federal Trade Commission and the CFPB, Computer and Financial Protection Bureau now, and in California and in Colorado. It's everywhere all at once. Um, and everyone is trying to tackle the same questions, which is what rules and systems can we put in place to better protect privacy, which requires an understanding of what it means, and figuring out how to drive those processes and convince people to adopt better structures and rules requires an understanding of how they think about it and how they conceptualize it. Um, and this book really is a, a, a you know, I could just throw this book at people as I walk in a room, and it would hopefully do good if they would read it. But but yeah, but also there's a paperback coming. There you so. go. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. um, to translate, it, I do think that that one thing that is that is genuinely difficult with the the myths that you debunk in the book is that there many of them are deeply embedded, um, especially you know in the minds of people with power that don't have a ton of time to think about these issues. They have you know, this much time in a moment, you catch their attention for, for a minute, or you're trying to catch their, their attention for, for an hour or a day. And uh, reading over this, thinking about, for example, the, the creepiness point, I think that it's a, a real deep, that myth is, is a particularly pernicious one because of the circularity problem you described, right? There, there is a risk of um, the, the, the powers, the entities that, that seek to control this data and take the power, uh, they have every incentive to, to build and structure both their systems and their interactions with us and with our governmental systems to push against this instinct that things are bad, that things are creepy, and to normalize the behavior. And they have successfully done that in many situations over time. And unfortunately, I think you, you do end up in the policy setting trying to make the creepiness argument, even though it feels wrong to rely on that, it's a shortcut. It's a shortcut to get a decision maker to pay attention to you. Um, and I do think that the, the use of storytelling and humanizing of privacy problems is really critical uh, in, in the policy sphere to, to pushing people uh, in the right directions, and that's uh, why I think the stories that you tell in this book and that are in Danielle's book are so powerful uh, to move folks. So I think that that, that is something I, I think a lot about. I don't know what to do about that, but it is an important factor. 
Um, and then I'll also just mention that, you know, I think it plays in also to the topic uh, that was discussed in earlier panels as well of like the harm conversation, which eternally comes up, right? Be in be part because we have to operate within the legal structures we have, and so many of them, whether you're talking about standing or Section 5 of the FTC Act or even, you know, privacy torts law, have this element, that some form of a harm or injury element to it, and what is that? And I hope that uh, this, this book can provide heft to the argument that the concept needs to be much broader than it's traditionally been treated, certainly by like the Supreme Court and, and other entities, but, but it's really important to think about the, the underlying values and the instrumental values to understand what broader harms happen when you don't build good rules, when you don't have the rules of respect privacy. Um, and then one one final point I will I will throw out there just to uh, see chaos is to say one line that really jumped out at me in the book uh, on was your point that you would choose you'd rather have privacy laws that are effective than ones that are conceptually beautiful. And one thing I've been thinking a lot about is is given your what do you uh, work on loyalty duties is how do you structure the, that type of a duty to be effective, yeah. and is there a trade-off between a way to structure it that may seem that is maybe more conceptually beautiful, but is there a trade-off there with how well it works when you dig down to the nitty-gritty of a future FTC or California agency trying to apply it to a company or someone trying to bring a lawsuit? Great, thank you. Neil, did you want to um, come back on any of the comments from the panelists? Mm -hmm. Very briefly, just because I was, I was asked two questions and I want to I wanna respond to this. But, but let, let me also say something that I, that I forgot to say at the beginning because I was just so excited to talk with you guys about privacy. Um, what, what, a, what a real treat it is that, that Mark uh, and, and Mike and Lex and everyone at the, at the, the team here have brought us all together today to talk about these things publicly in person uh, together. Um, it's just a, it's, it, it's a real uh, uh, honor and joy and delight and, and thank you all for, here, for having us here. And, uh, yeah. and Mark's argument is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the other the other the other <laughs> No, no drinks now, right? Yeah. Um, the reception is canceled. The other thing that, that I did want to say uh, that I and that this I, I also I think I have permission from Danielle as well, as well as from Ari and Woody is that these four books, uh, if it is not obvious, were were written together, not like all all sitting in a room working together, um, but but constant conversations and texts and 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 Zoom meetings and before the pandemic in-person meetings, including a couple that Mark hosted at his prior institution. Um, and I think if the books do hum similar tunes, it's because they, they were the process of a, of a private and confidential, but sort of <laughs> collaborative and generative and, and, and supportive uh, environment instead of relationships. And if there's, there's one thing that, that I think is, is really the hallmark of, and perhaps it's, it's, an, it's an irony or a paradox, is that the privacy community is, is remarkably social and inclusive and, and welcoming, and if it stops being that, let's talk about that. Because I think this, this is a collaborative set of problems that we all work on collectively as a community together. The, the, the two quick points, uh, instrumental claims and conceptual beauty. Uh, Mark uh, provoked um, that whether we, the, the book cedes too much ground in the balancing by saying that um, privacy is instrumental. I, I don't think so. It, it may practically cede too much ground. Um, but I mean that when I say that privacy is instrument, an instrumental value, I mean it the way that First Amendment law, actually real First Amendment law, not the rantings of the owners of car companies um, on, on Twitter, uh, or the, or, or, or the, or the, or the, or the po-face pronouncements of college dropouts um, on their social networks when they opine, gather around children, they say. Um, free expression in the United States in its traditional, general, most understood, mainstream form has been as an instrumental value. We, why do we give special protection? to freedom of expression? Well, there's a bunch of things that free expression can get us. 
One of them is democratic self-governance, and the, the most important one is democratic self-governance, and the close relationship to why do we have latitude for free expression? Well, if it helps us make good decisions in a democracy, that is a reason to give it special protection. Um, there are other justifications about the search for truth, or, or, or developing human autonomy, or, or faculties, but even the, the strongest uh, value in US politics, in US sort of which I read last night. I'll, I'll try it out. Constitutional political economy, um, <laughs> whatever that means, um, is itself an instrumental value. And I think that the, the response is, and one that I think as privacy scholars and advocates, we need to keep reminding people of is we treat free expression exactly the same way. And it's intellectually honest to do so, rather than to treat it as a sort of empty vessel that we can pour all of our hopes and dreams and in the case of certain companies, financial self-interest into. Um, with respect to the, uh, the, the, the conceptual beauty point, I, I, I really appreciate this, this Alan. I would say um, w w one of the problems that we saw in the last panel, that when Woody or I is on a, is on a panel, <laughs> the other one gets roped in by, uh, <laughs> by uh, automatically. Um, and so uh, unless Woody has anything to add here, I would say, um, I think a duty of loyalty is a kind of effective and flexible remedy. Um, if we can't, but you know, your question was a little more sharper than that. It was that if, if we can't have a federal duty of loyalty along the lines that we talk about in our papers about a duty of loyalty, what would be good enough? Well, actually, I think the ADPPA's duty of loyalty is pretty good, right? The, the, the conceptually beautiful duty of loyalty, we think, there should be a general, but sort of moderately strong, but not super strong duty of loyalty that applies to everything, acts in data subjects' best interests, supplemented by specific, more, uh, more demanding rules for the five contexts that Woody talked about earlier, um, data minimization, and gatekeeping, manipulation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's interesting about the ADPPA is it, it, it has a, it is, it is effective, but not conceptually beautiful. It has something that is labeled duty of loyalty, which is beautiful. Um, but it doesn't have a general duty. And it actually only has one, maybe two, of the secondary duties, right? There's an explicit, the duty of loyalty in the text of the ADPPA, which we need a sort of f more fun name for, um, is data minimization. And that is a sort of, in the loyalty two step, that is one of the, it's one of the six things we call for, general duty and five subsidiary rules. Well, we've got no general duty, We've got one, and probably maybe the most important of the subsidiary rules. There's also, depending how you read the draft, a prohibition on co cross-contextual behavioral advertising, which I think is a, is a personalization, uh, yeah. it's a, ug ugly, but maybe effective. Bad. So I think you know, th that would be an example of, I, it's not strong enough, right? But, but that, I would be accept, that would, I would consider that to be acceptable as a sort of effective version with one important caveat. And it's that if we pass a federal privacy statute, the business of privacy is not sort of, as Woody said in the last one, oh, we're done with that now. It's going to be a, a constant, ongoing process of reform and development and adjustment in exactly the same way that environmental law and consumer yeah. protection law and civil rights law have been a constant, ongoing process of, of adjustment and reform across decades rather than across weeks. Okay, great. Um, so we have about... 25 minutes for Q&A. Um, I might kick it off with one question, um, or yeah, a question which sort of tries to bring together the instrument, the statement about an instrumentality with the uh, conceptualization of privacy in a rights framework, which we started off the day with. Um, and I guess so I heard you say, Neil, and I'm not an apologist for the GDPR, and I have no dog in the fight, but um, you said something along the lines of, um, we should be thinking of privacy um, in terms of inst in instrumental terms to promote human human values, and not in terms of a fundamental right. Was that uh, is that is that um, accurate or N not in terms of intrinsic fundamental Intr rights. intrinsic fundamental rights? Right. So I wondered if we could unpack the kind of instrumental intrinsic binary from the you know th the relevance in the in the rights framework and that. Um, you know, at least in Europe and in general, I would argue rights are not trumps, right? So um, they're always subject to a balancing, and so you have um, the in, you can have the instrumental like you can have the instrumental conception of uh, within the rights framework, and I think what's happening in the the debate in Europe might be that the 
is the question of how much is there an intrinsic value in the right to control data in itself. Um, do you know, so I'm, I'm just trying to unpack it, so I'm sort of thinking out loud. Um, but I'd be interested in thoughts on how you, how you, bring, how you, how you sort of weave together those different threads where really what's, what's seen as potentially intrinsically valuable is the ability to control data in itself. And that's kind of that, um, you know, that sort of more, uh, I guess, Germanic idea of the um, rights to information. Um, as opposed to sort of thinking of the of, of privacy as a fundamental right itself being intrinsic. Yeah, I, I think th there's a there's a saying that we tell first year law students, um, and it's that hard cases make bad law. Right? It's proverbs of the law, right? Uh, and the basic insight here is that, well, if you want a good rule, maybe the really difficult case where everything starts to fight with itself and the system starts to break down, isn't the right doesn't produce the best test for the ordinary set of circumstances where, where values are not diametrically opposed to each other. I think there's a corollary to, to this, this proverb, which is that easy cases also can make bad law, which is that if, there are, if there's a legal conclusion which is sort of obvious, whether it's protect privacy or like free expression or someone's guilty, um, and there are four or five equally plausible competing explanations for, for why that's the case, it could be too easy to just say, hey, that's fine, because it's too e we don't need to figure out which one of the five is present or which one is the most important or how those are ordered against each other because we just know the outcome and we can move on. And I think for Europeans, particularly data protect, because they've got two fundamental rights to privacy in, in the charter, that data protection as a fundamental right is too easy of a question because I think it is not a conclusion that is that has been sufficient, that is sufficiently examined in terms of why data protection, what is data protection to the extent that data protection is, is rooted in fair information practice principles embodying the, the goal of informational self-determination if control doesn't scale, um, is, that, is that an obsolete right? I, I don't think it is, but I think the, the sort of the easiness with which some, by, by no means all, but sort of many European regulators and others um, approach these questions, I think, is a, is, a, is a problem. Europeans have the luxury of a textual, of two, three if you count the European Convention, textual constitutional rights to privacy. And so I think it's easy for them to say that's just protected. And so I would, in, I would encourage my, and I mean my friends, in, in Europe, uh, I used to be a European until Cambridge Analytica, um, uh, the, I would, yeah, it was a break. <laughs> um, I would encourage them to go deeper and to develop more explicitly their own justifications for why privacy matters and why data protection matters and why they are particularly essential to a democracy. Because I think then we can have really interesting conversations, and I think we can also have a more nuanced European approach to these than, than what is often perceived externally as something that is relatively blunt. And I've got lots more to say on that, and there's more nuance that I'm unable to, because I want to get to questions. But that's the sort of, hesitant. what do you guys think? So I was, you know, uh, since I started this, the, us down this road. Um, it's your fault. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I can, I can live with that. I control your drinks later. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I mean, I guess what I was, what I was aiming at. So I mean, I completely agree that like you need some sense of the reasons why something is significant. If the court, if courts, especially if you're gonna do it in sort of individualized decision-making processes where you have to bring a rule down to the ground, right? And you have to figure out, is it gonna, how's the balance gonna come out of this particular case? If you don't have like ways of talking about importance, it's really hard to do the balancing, right? And you need that. So I, I'm totally with you. I, I think that implies something about the mechanism by which like these rules are gonna be brought to the ground, right? Which is to say that they're gonna be done through sort of uh, repeated decision making in a sort of common law ish sense, which I think makes sense with given the work you guys have done and like attaching yourselves to a you know something like a duty of loyalty, which is a common law concept you know applied in sort of repeated case pattern. Uh, so you need the reasons, like I hear that, um, but it's sort of interesting that you invoked the First Amendment because you know whatever one thinks of the current state of First Amendment law in the United States, and I'm sure you and I think mostly the same things about that. Um, it's pretty obvious now that if you, if you invoke the First Amendment, you've got a big hammer, right? You've got a really big hammer, and a big hammer because uh, the court, this court especially has accepted that as like, that's like the pinnacle of the rights, right? It's like the most important foundational thing. And so, you know, when you start doing the balancing, which you still inevitably have to do, you're starting out on a point where like the default is very strongly in favor, right, of 
making sure that like you you know first amendments out there on the table you need a really good answer right you need a really good um and so even if it's in the form of like fine privacy is an instrumental right but it's like you know giving it a, the this sort of heft that danielle was giving it earlier like where it i think is is rhetorically important in terms of where the starting point is there in terms of you know where we make the balance and so i actually think a lot of that work is in the book right like i think a lot of your description is there i guess i would I would encourage you to sort of embrace it more and, you know, uh, embrace its centrality to the value. Um, I don't know, I, in, a, in a way that the word instrumental just strikes me as not doing. Yeah. So. The only thing, that I, 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 that's a good point. I, I would say, the only thing I would say, not even a response, but sort of in, in conversation with that, I guess that is a response, um, <laughs> is, uh, is, is that the, one thing that I that I try and do in the second half of the book, which, which I didn't have a chance to, to lay out given given uh, my wordiness and the time constraints, um, is that I want to make the case for privacy as a good thing, as a thing that lets us get other things that we care about, and things like identity, political freedom, consumer protection. Privacy is is essential to those things, and I think. The, the work is, is done by others as, as, as well as me. I think there, there are, there are in, privacy is a big hammer, um, but the various pieces have been disassembled and yeah. they're sort of lying around. And yeah. I think it's just a matter of, of, of picking up those pieces that, that many people feel intuitively and, and telling stories. The first story we tell is the story about why we should care about privacy in the first place. And, this, and then there's subsidiary stories about individual context. And so I think. Um, I, I want to assemble privacy into a, a big hammer, but a big hammer not just as a, as a tax on innovation or a restriction on free expression, but as an enabler mm -hmm. of really important things that everybody cares about. Yeah. And Neil, just, just to follow up on, on Mark's question, the, the third value, privacy as consumer protection, you could say is um, uh, almost troubling because of the way we conceive of consumer protection right now. It doesn't mean it is troubling in the ether. It just means, you know, as we understand consumer protection, which is really no protection, so we so <laughs> assume you can do anything if you kind of tell us in the privacy policies, what he calls them, anti-privacy policies, right, and you don't lie to yeah. us, um, that, that maybe that's what's sort of bugging you, Mark, too. Um, and you know, and I use the concept of human dignity as personal integrity, that that is, um, I think you would agree with me, right, Neil, that is the human dignity of self-respect and social esteem. They are, though, valuable in themselves, right, for people. So it, I just think it's a matter of vocabulary versus, like, meaningful difference between where we're at, right, Neil? But some of those vocabulary words, like consumer protection, Make us all want to cry, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now that we think about it, but you're having this well, conversation. This is Jerry's point about, uh, about civil rights earlier, right? That you know neoliberalism hollows everything out. Yeah, um, that's right. No, and no, right. And that's not to say that it should be right at all. Right. At all. Right. I just think I'm just trying to kind yeah. of wrestle with my yeah. why you thought we would be so far apart, where I think we're very not far apart yeah. at all, and maybe that's. Does that make sense? I was just yeah, yeah, trying no, to I, I puzzle was, it through for us. I was making it as a rhetorical point, like I, yeah. I, but I think rhetoric matters, right? And how, yes, especially course. in cases, yeah, and so, course. so you know, the comp, the consumer protection thing, the thing that's always struck, and this is probably just totally consistent with the, the you know, the theme of power that's running through your whole thing. So, if, if we were to put our antitrust hats on, right, the the, mm. the rule of antitrust standing is that you have to show harm to competition, yeah. not harm to individual competitors, right? Mm. Because the conception of harm is not about harming individual entities. It's about to the it's a net it's a network problem, right? It's a social yeah. social and yeah. so so it's it's interesting that though that kind of argumentation is there, right, and is accepted in certain places, it's just it's not used that way in in privacy and maybe that's the point is like you need we need to grab that, right? And say, you know, privacy has the same kind of social like status, meaning like it's not about it's not it, it's not only about harm to individuals, right? It is about what the harm is to the society, right, for life, so. May I say one more thing, mm -hmm. just because it's so wonderful. Um, Alan, when you said that you were the cedar of chaos as the chair of his board at Epic, I have to say there is nothing more inapposite to Alan than seeding <laughs> chaos. 
My man is a, a seating a, a calm, always. <laughs> yeah. So so sorry, I always embarrass you, I know, Alan, but taking the chance, right? Why not again? Um, but but and with, what is so amazing is that a lot of the legislative work that he is, you know, he won't tell, Alan will admit this, but he is helping write these laws, right? And the valuable parts of ADPPI are thanks to Alan. So, I, I'm, so well, I'm, I'm, I'm following with the embarrassment, friend. And I wanted it to follow up, take that, that key cue to follow up on the yeah. point Neil made earlier uh, that I think gets this, gets also at this point of, uh, of maybe the rights-based approach versus some of the other like, concepts we've been discussing, um, and especially the point you made about and the analogy in your book to environmental law, which I think is critical. I mean, I think we look at the moment we're at right now, luckily, blessedly, I do think that many people, especially folks in a position to, to make laws and regulations, do understand that privacy matters. They may not know exactly why, and they should all read your book to understand why, but they are, they, they, on some level, they get it. And, and the uh, law we've many of us, Bill we've many of us have been referencing is the uh, American uh, Data Protection and Privacy Act, uh, which is, has been introduced in, in, was introduced in Congress um, in the Hill in, back in June and has already made its way through the House Commerce Committee, which is the first privacy bill to do that uh, since two, two, did the 2000 bill even get that far? Uh, and with a massive bipartisan majority, and just it was there, right? And it came out. And one thing that uh, I think was uh, we felt was very important in the ge genesis of that over the course of the summer, when there were hearings and mm -hmm. things were moving very rapidly, was that um, the bill in its initial form, a lot of pieces to it, but it has rules about and it categorizes data into sensitive and non-sensitive categories, and basically has stricter rules about uses and collection and transfer for sensitive data than non-sensitive. In the original version of the bill, it was an uh, uh, intense consent model for sensitive data. It was mm -hmm. any collection, transfer, use has to get affirmative express consent to find it. Very, like, pop-ups everywhere. And we looked at this and we said, well, this is somebody trying to ratchet up. Uh, but is this going to work mm -hmm. <laughs> structurally? Is this going to serve the underlying values? Um, and we pushed very hard for them to, to change tack a little bit and instead say, no, no, let's directly restrict those practices rather than kick it to the individual users and say, we're going to give you pop-ups all the time anytime there's sensitive data, especially because the sensitive data category is very broad. And instead, we pushed for successfully for uh, a, a strict necessity requirement. Uh, with particularly targeted advertising being completely prohibited as a legitimate use case for sensitive data. Um, so, so that's kind of a move in the regulatory space that I think, I, I, I believe gets at this sort of underlying thread we're talking about. And then the other, other quick point I make on that front, building on the environmental analogy, you know, that we're at an impasse right now with that effort where really there's a disagreement between the folks working on the bill at the federal level and with the delegations out here in California, and the disagreement is over whether there should be a federal privacy law now in 2022 that preempts state law. And this is really, I think, is, is a, gets at the same problem, I think, which is that, that there's an argument for that it's better to have genesis at the state level of privacy rights and innovation on privacy um, state by state. But if it is a value, but if the values that we want privacy law to, to, to enshrine are fundamental and should be shared by all, then does that actually work? Does it work to have different privacy rules in California, Colorado, Utah, Virginia? Is that good um, if, if it is generative of new innovation in the next five to 10 years? Or would it be better to have a big bipartisan bill pass at the federal level that may have you know trade-offs in it, but, but fundamentally is a statement that like this thing is valuable and this is how the structure should be enshrined. So, and, and in the environmental context, would we, would we be better off if there hadn't been you know, federal legislation on environmental issues that certainly blocked some innovation at the states, uh, but set a stage for further conversations in the future? Okay.